68. Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. Our next major milestone is 200 Patreon supporters. We are only 68 members away from achieving this goal. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Cinco's or a jackhammer chatterbait, all Patreon supporters will receive 20% off their orders to Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Tackle, 5% off their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 10% off Tiger Crankbaits, 10% off Catoctin Creek Custom Rods. You'll also gain access to our private Facebook group community, members-only content, weekly Patreon supporter giveaways, and so much more. For more information, click on the link in the episode description or click the link above my head. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Two, one. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And today, I've been asked about this, to do this a bunch, is, well, why you have West Virginia on your logo. It's a part of it. Why haven't you talked about West Virginia? Well, to me, I just didn't know there's a lot of fishing opportunities in West Virginia. Uh, when you look at it on a map, it doesn't like a lot of it is maybe the Potomac, the Shenandoah kind of maybe, but I didn't know a lot about it, uh, honestly enough. But luckily I got in contact with uh, Bryson Grimes, uh, an old college angler who who lives out there. And he's going to be talking a little bit more about like what West Virginia actually has to offer. Bryson, thank you so much for coming on today. Yeah, thanks, Thomas. Thanks for having me. Uh, I've watched several of your episodes. Always appreciate watching them. So appreciate you having me on. So, I mean, really get into it. Like, have you, are you a native West Virginian? Did you move there? Yeah, no, born and raised. I live in Kingwood, Preston County. It's probably 20 minutes or so outside of Morgantown, which is where West Virginia University is. So about an hour south of Pittsburgh. So yeah, born and raised. Haven't left. That's right. Now, I know know we're going to get into this a little bit later, but it kind of gets into the story here. You were a college angler, correct? Yes, sir. Yep. About the same time you were, actually. Yeah, that was actually pretty crazy, too. Um, And growing up in Northern Virginia, we had the title Potomac, but if you didn't want to drive through I-95 traffic, there was a bunch of little lakes. Right. So what really got got your DNA, your craft polished up living in West Virginia? Where did you go? Ah, man, honestly, just, there's just several small local lakes. Um, We, I think Stonewall would be that training ground, the best lake for the training ground in the state. Other than that, man, just a bunch of small local lakes. Grew up fishing. My dad was an avid tournament fisherman, so I grew up with him fishing, practicing for tournaments. He'd take me to a couple youth tournaments, maybe. Uh, Just family fishing. Um, But yeah, I mean, if you want to fish a bigger bfl size tournament you have to go to the potomac or smith mountain um they have one up in mosquito in ohio that's relatively the same distance but yeah not a whole lot of big tournaments around here uh so mostly just you know lake hop in the small lakes and each lake's a little bit different so you get a little different feel for each lake but yeah i mean that's that's pretty much it man just fishing around the house as much as possible and you mentioned stonewall jackson stonewall jackson like your your biggest lake um, acreage wise, no, but it's close. Some it would be Summersville, which is, I believe, only 2,900 acres. So, Damn. they're small wow. lakes. I think Stonewall is 2,750, if I remember correctly, 2,750. So, it's small. So, and that, uh, is that electric motor only, or is it a no, big outboard? No, 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 it's it's not horsepower restricted. So, yeah, you can you can run your big out on both the, on most of the lakes around. Actually, um, there are a few little hidden gems that are you know electric only but you know 50 75 acre lake maybe 100 acre lakes more big ponds than anything actually but uh but yeah i mean that's that's the uh it's not the biggest lake but it's the lake that we have the most tournaments on i would say so it, it gets the most fishing pressure for sure what is what is the flavor of lake jackson are we talking you know muddy stumpy brown water super clear deep banks like what was the topography like a little bit of both to be honest with you and i think that's what makes it such a fun lake is it's diverse <clears throat> it uh it's got a lot of standing timber so they clear cut the main river channel whenever they impounded the lake in the 80s but other than that once you get off the main drag the main river channel it's all standing timber and you know this time of the year springtime when we get a lot of rain it'll 
it'll muddy up the water a little bit and stay in the water. Um, but it also has deep bluffs. Um, and, you know, in the summertime, the fish will get offshore, offshore uh, and when the water will clear up a little bit. But, but that's why I like that lake so much is because, like I said earlier, it probably is the best lake in our state to hone your craft because you can do a little bit of everything. Um, a lot of our lakes are so small that they're, they're spot lakes per se. You can't really pattern them. They're just, mm-hmm. they're just too small. Catch one on a point. Well, there's only three points on the whole lake. It's just too small, you know. So Stonewall, it offers that. You know, you always read in Bassmaster magazine when I was growing up. They'll be on the primary points, then the secondary points, then they'll go back to the spawning flats to spawn, you know, and then work their way out. Well, that like has those types of options where you can like follow the fish. You can learn where well, they're going to be here. Then they move there. Then they go back and do their deal and spawn on the shallow flats or in the backs of the pockets or backs of creeks and then come back out. Whereas a lot of our lakes just don't offer that opportunity. So, I mean, you can catch them 30 foot deep live scoping if you want, or you can go up and catch them in the mud flipping if you want, you know? So it offers a little bit of everything, although it is a small lake. Is it just largemouth or is there a smallmouth population? So there is a small, smallmouth population. I have personally never caught a smallmouth there, but if you catch a smallmouth there, it, it is usually a good one. The same with wow. spotted. There's some spotted bass in there. I've heard of people catching three, three and a half pound spotted bass. Um, I think the biggest I've ever caught is two, maybe two and a half. But I mean, I know a guy caught a smallmouth in there a year or so ago, and I believe it was almost seven pounds. But it Damn. looked like. It, it was a weird smallmouth, man. I'd never seen one like it. It looked like it had spawned with some of the largemouth that had been in the lake. It had like a largemouth body, but it looked like a smallmouth. It was weird. It, it looked like a, some sort of hybrid to me. But yeah, to answer your question, there are not many of them, but there's some nice ones in there. So it's got really good diversity. Hmm. Yeah. It's got really good diversity. Yeah. When we're talking weight wise, what can people expect, generally speaking, in the spring? Yeah. <clears throat> so. To win your average tournament, it's going to be knocking on 20 pounds. I've oh, seen a bad. few tournaments over. Yeah. You generally the 17 to 19 pounds, but I'll say Stonewall's feast or famine. It doesn't have the population of fish to where you can catch fish all day long. Um, it's like if you go and have a good day, you're going to get five to ten bites but if you get those five to ten bites you're going to be in the teens on the back you know have a nice bag but if there's a 50 boat tournament like there was a bass nation tournament there last weekend the buddy trail i believe it took just under 18 pounds to win i think it took a five and a half pounder for lunker but out of i think there was 49 teams maybe there was 53 they're right around 50 teams there were seven limits caught and 15 zeros <laughs> So you're going to catch them and you're going to catch nice ones or you're not. You know, that's what it's a love hate relationship for people in the state. People love it or people hate it. So it's kind of a controversial lake in that regard. Does the does the West Virginia Wildlife Resources do any type of stocking program or what's your relationship? Uh, anglers relationship with them? Yeah, not, not uh, we've been on them to try to help the bass population. And I think they've listened because they've just released, uh, introduced a house bill where starting this summer, I think July, they're going to, I got the paper here, actually. They're going to stock 4,000 F1, uh, otherwise known as tiger bass. And they're going to do a three-year study on them. So they're going to stock them in a handful of lakes, Stonewall being one of them. I'll just go down the lake. Jennings Randolph Lake, which I know you had Miles Paul on a while back, and I know he fishes Jennings Randolph a lot. Um, so Jennings, Stonewall, Summersville, Cheat Lake, Eastland, Bluestone, and R.D. Bailey. So they're going to stock 4,000, not 4,000 in each length, 4,000 total. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So it said um, proportionate to the acreage of the lakes, which a lot of those lakes are small. So they're going to stock 4,000 F1s, and then I believe three years from now, they're going to see how it did. It's going to be pretty much a trial. So hopefully we can talk them into continuing that program, because I think that would help. 
because right now they're not big on the bass fishing they do they do some uh they plant brush piles and a lot of that's through the bass nation as well them and the dnr you know they try to help with the structure but as far as stalking no they you know to my knowledge unless it's a local club driven stalking program the the dnr hasn't been much involved they usually stick to the cold water the, the trout fishing they're big into the trout fishing yeah, that's interesting that they're doing it by size. Like, I guess the math could math, sort of speak, but I feel like it'd be better just to put four thousand just in Stonewall Jackson or, yeah. or, or Jennings. I would love that. Yeah, I would like them to do four thousand in every lake listed, or four thousand in one lake and really study that lake in particular. But uh, at least it's a step in the right direction. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is. What, what, what would you consider a better lake than uh, Jennings or Stonewall, just in general? Uh, if you want to catch numbers of bass, Jennings, you're going to run through the numbers. You could catch 30, 40, 50 bass a day, but the average tournament there is going to take seven to nine pounds to win. Hmm. Where a Stonewall, you're going to catch, you know, the average field is going to catch a limit, barely squeak out a limit, but they're going to have the 10 to 20 pounds. You know what I mean? It's just two different completely. And Jennings is a highland reservoir. So, you know, at the deepest point of it, it's a couple hundred foot deep. Crystal clear. You can see down 20, 30 foot. All smallmouth. Well, no, I won't say all smallmouth. 99% smallmouth. Hmm. But, yeah, just two different two different bodies of water. Isn't there a, uh, a warm water discharge lake, too? Is that there Mount is? Storm? Mount Storm, yes. There is. And it's, man, it's going through a tough patch right now, too. It's a... Uh, they're not running the plant as much as they used to. They're not discharging as much of that warm water. And uh, this fish are used to that warm water. So this winter when it got cold, there I heard, I've not been up there in a few years, but I heard that there was a pretty big fish kill. Oh, and, wow. and I don't know if the state stocked them or if they were in there originally, but the hybrid bass population caught on there. So if you want to catch a hybrid bass, that's the place to go. But they've put a hurting on the bass population probably just because they just eat so much more. There's just not enough, you know, forage to go around. So it's kind of in a, it's in a rough shape right now. Do you guys have tournaments on that lake or is that one that's avoided? Okay. No, no, no. There's tournaments on it. Yeah. It's small. Like I think it's only a thousand acres maybe, but it's not horsepower restricted either. With the three rig lakes you mentioned, besides Stonewall, we're, we're dealing with clear, clear water kind of techniques, deep water. Mm-hmm. But then with all three of the lakes, Highly pressured, small bodies of water for big tournaments. How does that formulate you as an angler? Because especially we're going to be going into college here soon. Yeah. Uh, man, you, I don't know. You just get tough to, or you get used to the tough days. I mean, because a lot of them, you put 50, 60 boats on a 2,500 acre lake, you're used to fishing around people. You're used to fishing. I know you fish the Potomac a lot, where you pull into, uh, I don't know, any matter woman, any chickamauks and when that grass bed was giant and full and there'd be 50 boats and a you know you could cast and hit every one of them it's not quite that proportionate but you get used to being around boats you get used to fishing behind people you know downsizing lures just to get your fifth keeper you know anything you can do just to get a bite so i mean that's what i say it's not the best training ground because you're not gonna you don't have those slug fest where then when you go down to the southern impoundments or even over the Potomac where it just always catch, you know, you always have decent bags to win. You just don't get that programmed in your mind to, okay, it's not just catching a limit. It's catching a nice limit. You know what I mean? A lot. Thank of you. Yeah. Catch a limit. If you catch a limit, if you catch a kicker, a three, four pounder, you're going to win money or you're going to win the tournament. That's just how it is around here. Almost, almost like Stonewall notwithstanding because it is the one lake where you, you do have to catch them that's the mind frame you have to have when you pull into the parking lot stonewall and you see some of the guys that fish there all the time you say okay it, we're gonna have to catch them today it's not just get five bites whereas most of the other lakes around it's get five bites and you'll be there you know what i mean so you got so when you go to potomac or upper bay or smith mountain or bugs island or up north the chautauqua or thousand islands it's just a completely different mindset because you got to get that out of your mind. You're not going to go to St. Lawrence and catch five. I just need to catch five keepers. That you know that's going to land you in 200th place. You know you got to be targeting the bigger fish. So it's a completely different mindset. Culturally, does that is that a hard thing to buck? And is and it sounds like what you're mentioning here is 
it's better to grow up on a big fish lake versus growing up with that Ohio mindset. Yeah. I know when I moved to Western Maryland two years ago and I started fishing a lot of tournaments on the upper Potomac where they have this huge section dammed off where seven pounds will probably get you in the top five. Yeah. And when I started to go back home, I realized like my mindset has changed a lot about how I fish. Yep. 100. Was that, how did you, did, did you buck that at all as you got into tournament fishing? I mean, I think after a while you, you just learn like you, you have to. And, um, I mean, I know I have a good friend, Will Diffenbach, who qualified for the classic through the Bass Nation two years ago. He went to Knoxville and, um, he grew up kind of fishing the Ohio River. And I know him and I have had several conversations where he doesn't like to go back and fish it because he thinks it hurts his fishing because it, it changes your mind. You get used to, I need five bites or you can't pattern them as well. So it's, well, I'll run to this spot, this spot, this spot. And then you fish that a lot. You kind of train yourself to fish like that. And then when you go to, a, like I say, Potomac or Thousand Islands or Champlain where it takes big weight and it takes, you know, catching fish and pattern them. It, it just, it can mess with you. And it, I think it truly can mess up. Like you said, it changed your, you know, your mindset. And then whenever you go back to a place where you need to catch them, you know, it can hurt you just the way you approach the fishery. Does it make you a better bass angler though? Like if you had your druthers, would you rather have grown up with this Ohio mindset or grown up on Gunnersville, a uh, Lake Fork, a big fish lake. Uh, man. No, I, I 100% would rather grow up on a fork or a Gunnersville, just straight catching them all the time, you know, 25, 30 pound bags. But, I mean, there's a time where it helps. You know, I know, I mean, a lot of the guys that do well around here whenever they travel, it's the grinder type tournaments. You know what I mean? It's It's those tournaments that, well, we're going to get five to seven bites. Okay, well, that's a good day in West Virginia. You know, we'll take that. So, you know, I know those, the tougher it is, a lot of the times the better we'll do when it comes to those bigger level tournaments. But, yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I like catching them. If you're going to say you have a chance to go to the Ohio or Fish Gunnersville or wherever, I mean, yeah, put me there. How did that – so we get we, – we're going to pivot now to where you decided that you wanted to do kind of the college fishing thing. Yeah. How did you find your niche then, your groove with that? Because I'm assuming your first couple of tournaments, there's a little bit of a culture shock when you were going to the Smiths, at the Chesapeake and the Potomac. For sure, for sure. So, um, man, I knew about college fishing, and I was fishing tournaments at the time. But like I said, I was, I'd only fished around here. Like, I, I didn't know if I had something I could do or even wanted to do. And one of my good friends, Brent Daudrill, was fishing with my other friend, Will, at the time. And he, he graduated and he called me up and he said, Hey man, you ought to fish it. Like you may struggle, but you'll learn a lot. And I'm, I'm glad it's the best thing I ever did. I wish I would have done it. I only got to do it two years. Cause I, you know, I waited out those first two years thinking, no, nah, that's not something I want to do just cause I don't have any experience. But, uh, yeah, man, went over to the Potomac the first time I had a little bass tractor at the time, actually me and my tournament partner at the time, Ryan Radcliffe went over a couple weeks before the tournament. And I can remember putting in there at Smallwood and Mad Woman and thinking, what did I get myself into? Like, and that was just Mad Woman. As soon as we went out on the main river, I was like, this is like nothing I've ever seen. But man, we caught them, caught them decent, ended up loving it, falling in love with the lake, with the well river, I guess. And coming back a couple weeks later, I think we finished 13th or 14th. And at the time, you only had to finish in the top 15 to qualify for the regional tournament. So that was the only one we did that year until the regional, which was on the upper bay. And uh, went to that one, same experience, just, man, what did I get myself in? Like, I don't know. This is like nothing I've ever seen. And, the, you know, the Upper Bays, the Potomac's a different world, but the Upper Bay's a different world from the Potomac. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it was a struggle. I think we fished that region, and it was in September, and it was fishing pretty tough. Um, I think we only caught two, maybe had five pounds or something. Didn't move I, I, don't, on. I think that was the one that we were in. I'd have to check the stuff i think it was in 15 14 14 okay or maybe it was 13 i think it was i think that one was in 13 thomas okay 13 yeah, yeah. we were there in 15 yeah yeah so but yeah because the september on the on the bay it was the same thing for us for our last regional was on the bay in september it was this conditions were shit and yeah. 
it's hard to catch a limit two days. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. So, but yeah, learned learned a lot from that trip, and then the following year would be fourteen. They announced the schedule, and they were going back to the bay, and they're having the regional in Potomac. Yeah. So circled both of those. Like we're definitely going to hit those. Um, at the time, I think they had a cap on how many teams you could. I can't remember if there was a cap or what it was, but we didn't end up fishing the Smith Mountain. We said, okay, we'll send two or three other teams to the Smith Mountain because I want to fish. Chautauqua was the other one. There was three of us. Yes. Smith Mountain, Upper Bay, Chautauqua. I said, okay, I've been on Chautauqua. I want to fish Chautauqua, and I'm going back to the bay because I want to get revenge because it kicked my butt. It, it just, well, I mean, we, you know, it was horrible in September. So we ended up going back. Um, Got on a really good bite on the flats. Uh, spent some time learning them, and uh, ended up winning that tournament. I think we had nineteen eleven. Um, it was in July, I believe it was in July. So ended up winning that tournament and then qualifying for uh, the regional in Potomac, uh, which ended up fishing it. Which I'm pretty sure you fished it. Yeah, I believe I remember you guys doing quite well actually. Um, but yeah, WVU actually ended up winning that tournament. Um, but we finished 14th in it. I think they took 15 fished on day two, the top 15, and then the top 10 advance, advanced to nationals. So we missed out on nationals again for the second year. But we got to fish that second day. But man, I remember that one being kind of stingy too. It was in October. I remember it being pretty stingy as well. Yeah, that one was tough. That was also our first <laughs> That was my first time me and my brother fished a two-day event before in our lives. And I think we were like top three after day one. And then yeah. we were like, well, shit. We <laughs> never had to go back out there and have a backup plan. Yeah, yeah. And somehow we guts and nuts enough weight to be in the top 10 to go to nationals. But yeah. it op that was the first time it's like, you fish differently in a multi-day event. It's oh. completely different. Yeah, 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 for sure. It, it's, it's much different than just your one-day shootout. There's a little more strategy and game planning, but, but yeah, man, those two years of college fishing, I didn't get to fish many tournaments, but it, it did, it opened my eyes to what fishing can and should be, you know what I mean? Cause that's, you know, I mean, those, those rivers are about four hours from the house. So they're far enough, not, you can't really do a day trip per se, but you could mm -hmm. do an extended weekend trip, weekend trip. And that really opened my eyes to, you know, how fun and how fishing those types of rivers should be and could be, you know. So it was a great learning experience. I, I wish, wish I could go back and do the two years previous, and uh, hit, you know, more Smith Mountain or more of Champlain when they went up there and stuff. So if anyone's thinking about doing high school or college fishing, if you can get, you know, someone to help you in high school, obviously, but in college fishing, man, I would. I'd recommend doing it because you'll learn so much. Even if you go and you don't catch them, just getting to experience rivers and lakes that you would normally not get to experience is so, so valuable. And I miss the old format that they had because it really meant a lot more when you made it to regionals and you made it to the nationals. I mean, I'm not to sound like an old guy, but now I feel like they make it way yeah. too easy, too many boats, but yeah. it breeds a better angler where – yeah, like you, you had to do well over a season and you had to be consistent. And then also you'd have that two dare at the end that you had to figure out. Yep. Yep. I agree. I agree. What, what are you up to now then fishing wise? Um, so at the moment, just fishing a bunch of tournaments around the house. I did a couple year stint where I did co-angling in the Toyota series, which was fun, uh, different, but fun. Um, I traveled with Will Diffenbach, my buddy, and uh, we hit the Potomac and Thousand Islands and St. Lawrence, but learned a ton, uh, had a couple of decent finishes, nothing great, you know, made the cut, made the day three cut, but uh, learned a ton because that's, man, that's kind of my end goal is what I want. I want to be on the front of the boat in the fish in the Toyota series. Um, so I thought, well, get in the back of the boat and learn. Plus, I traveled with him, so I got to fish the whole week with him. Cause it'd been since the college day, since I'd been to the battalion, I'd been there in eight, nine years since, you know, mm. then. So got to go back to it, fished it for two or three years. And then decided this year to, uh, to not jump back in. I'm just stay around the house trying to, I had a pole barn bill. It's actually what I'm setting in now to keep the boat in. So I'm hope trying to get it paid off this year and then maybe go get 
trade this old girl in the the stratus in for a new boat and then maybe jump in those toyotas next year or the year after so man just fishing a, a ton around about every weekend around the house just tournaments stonewall in particular most of them um, i actually live closer to deep creek than i do stonewall so once season opens up in maryland i'll probably hit deep creek some too as well because it's it's another fantastic lake i know it's not in west virginia but it's a another one of those it's it's probably the best lake within a couple hour radius of the house it's a special place deep yeah. creek really is um if you haven't gone and check out that guys go check it out grass everywhere the di- it's just a it's and it's great in the fall a lot of yeah. lakes suck in the fall that place though maybe because it's such a, a high elevation it's really good yeah yeah it, it's fantastic year honestly man year round it, it's a phenomenal lake I, I wish i wish there were more tournaments on it because I would spend more time on it, but I'm going to try to make it a point to go over there more this year, regardless. You mentioned the Toyota series and I'm glad you did. Cause I've always been kind of a fan of the Toyota series, mm-hmm. you know, all the way back to my left days. But a lot of people nowadays, if you ask them where they want to go, they always say the opens, the opens, the opens. So, I mean, everyone's heard my thoughts on the show about the two, like w- what are your thoughts on, on why would you pick the Toyotas? Yeah. I, I mean, I think you have to put it in perspective. What are, what are your end goals? If your end goals or to fish professionally, make a living of it, then yeah, I think probably the opens are the better route. Because if you want to fish professionally, I mean, because if you qualify through the Toyotas, then you got to go through, uh, gosh, I can't remember, the Pro Circuit, whatever they call it now. Mm-hmm. What was used to be the FLW Tour. And I just don't think it stands up to, obviously, the Elite Series. So I think if you want to fish professionally and make a living of it or attempt to make the living of it, then yeah, I think the opens are the way to go. But the Toyota series for this area, because they have six or eight regions, and for the northern region, you know you're always going to fish Potomac. And you're yeah. always going to fish Champlain, and you're always going to fish St. Lawrence just because that's the only three places they go year after year after year after year. Yeah, um, that's, which, that's the it, truth. Which is good and bad. I'd like to see them diversify that a little bit, but I understand why they do it. But it's a great great training proving ground because man those guys are good really really good you're gonna learn a ton um they have the championship at the end of the year which is no entry fee if you have the phoenix bonus i think it pays 235,000. if you don't i think it's just under 200. so that alone there if you qualify for the championship makes it well worth it whereas the opens don't have that plus you have to fish all nine in the opens if you want to qualify whereas the toyota you can fish the three or if you do a fourth, you can do the wild card division. Mm-hmm. So for me, I don't really have any aspirations to go pro. It's just not going to happen. Um, so for me, it just makes sense to fish the Toyota series and try to make that championship and fish for a quarter million dollars. Cause that's a big tournament, man. There's a lot of really big names, a lot of really good fishermen that fish that tournament, all the Toyota series. If you win one of those, it's a big deal, real big deal. If you finish in the top 10, it's a big deal. I 100 percent agree, and the one thing I wish they would they would kind of do would be a, a mid Atlantic series because you could go to Smith yeah. Mountain Lake, Potomac, Kerr. Um, there's another big lake in our area. I'm trying to I can't remember it. The comment section will will, will help me with that. That yeah. you could go to, so we don't because I really feel like when you go to to the St. Lawrence and Champlain, that is that is a northern division. Mm, I agree, and it's we- I- weird that the Potomac is considered northern. It's it's not. Yeah. So a few a few years ago, I believe it was actually during COVID twenty twenty. They actually did a Atlantic or Mid Atlantic division. I can't remember exactly what they called. It. I think it was Mid Atlantic, where they did Hartwell, Norman, Potomac, and that was like my dream schedule. Like I love that because I've been to yeah. Norman several times. Love Norman, and uh, that man they just didn't have the turnout for. It. And I think part of it was probably because of COVID, but they split the northern. They had the northern. I think the northern was St. Lawrence, Champlain. St. Clair, I believe. And I think they had to move those around because of COVID. Um, but they just didn't. I think they only had like 75 or 80 boats there at Hartwell or Norman. Whereas when you group everyone into the Northerns, you know, when you keep the making division, 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 because I think they had 14 divisions that year. It just cut, them down. It cut the yeah. fields in half. Like, yeah. So they didn't have the turnout they wanted. Although I would, man, I'd love to do like a Smith Mountain. And they used to do, the Northerns used to do James River, Smith Mountain, um obviously potomac upper bay they haven't been to the upper bay in years either 
um, they used to come south and do, only do like one north. They do like Champlain and then they do Smith Mountain and James River. You know, they do two of the mid Atlantic ones and only one northern. Whereas now, where they do the Champlain St. Lawrence every single year, they just change the, t- the dates. You know, I agree with you. It's more of a, if you fish that division, you better be good at catching smallmouth because you're going to have to. A hundred percent. And it's weird because I've been racking my brain. Like, what major lake in North Carolina would you think they've gone to the most for bigger tournaments like that? Is it Norman? I think it's mm, Norman. I would say, I would say it'd have to be. I don't know of any. I mean, I know there's several good lakes in that area. High Rock's a good one. High Rock. Um, yeah. But that's not a multi-day event. You Norman. know what I mean? Like, Yeah. Yeah. And that's just so weird about our area is if you if you count in Pennsylvania, Virginia, and North Carolina, there really isn't a lake. I'm going to preface that by guys by a lake that they've had a multi day event at. I mean, of course, you could say the James or the Potomac, but besides that, the 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 yeah. the, the newest multi day event that we've had here was on Kerr last year with the Opens. Besides that, it's weird that this group of states is kind of ostracized from holding a multi day yeah. event, generally speaking. But, yeah. yeah, yeah. For whatever reason, this region and it has fantastic fishermen and, and even good lakes. But like you said, the Virginia, Maryland, Potomac, notwithstanding, uh, Virginia, North Carolina. I mean, you get down in South Carolina, they hit Hartwell and Santee a lot. So I would say those three: North Carolina, Virginia, Maryland, kind of gets forgotten, other than Potomac. Um, well, and Upper Bay, but but those three lakes. I mean, you just don't see the multi-day events, other than I know. Smith Mountain has the Oakley Big Bass Tour, and Norman does every year. But as far as a Toyota Series level, like you mm-hmm. said, the only one I can remember in recent years is last year for the Opens. And, and that's hard because if you want to make a go at this thing, and I think Smallmouth Crush, I, I, and again, I don't follow a lot of his channel, but I know he moved up north, and I wonder how much of it was that, mm-hmm. yeah, like if you want to make a shot at the Opens or Toyota and you live in this area, you might as well move to upstate New York because that's where most yep. of the damage has to be done. Yep, I, I would agree with that. Uh, we we live in a tough tough region for that because you're driving ten to twelve hours north, multiple, you know, twice a year, guaranteed. Mm-hmm. Um. So yeah, I mean, it makes it tough. It does. Um. Like I said, I wish I'd like to see them diversify that schedule a little bit, but I know that those cities pay every year, so that's where they're going to go. Is what it comes down to, and, and that's fine. But it's sad, it's sad. But like, I mean, I think the um. The MLF went to Stonewall Jackson uh, to shoot a show there, believe it or not. So I'm going to be interested they to did. see. They did. Like, how many boats was that? Uh, so they did the team series there where they do like three guys are on a team and they can communicate with within each other. So there was only like less than 10 boats each day. I mean, I think there was three teams each day. So three teams of three. So I think there was nine each day. So it it wasn't, and it was through the week, so there was no one there. So they had nine, essentially nine boats for the entire lake. So it was, but they caught them good, better than what I expected when I heard they were coming in the fall. Because you know how the fall can kind of be funky no matter where you're at. You'll hit it, and it'll be good. Or you'll hit it, and it'll be absolutely horrible. And they, they caught them pretty well, pretty well for being fall. So that was, that was I was glad to see them, and I was glad to see West Virginia Tourism put up the money to bring them here because maybe because the state that's what our tourism runs on is outdoors you know we have a beautiful state we don't have big lakes but we have several river streams and we have lakes that you know can hold small tournaments but i wish the the state would do a better job in um trying to get people to come fish you know increase revenue by the outdoors because that's essentially all we got as far as tourism yeah i think the whole way that they do it bass specifically and i've always crucified for this it's like it shouldn't just be like whoever pays you the most because that system left to the extreme means you're going to beaver lake in the sabine 60 times in a row yeah. and it it should also be generally speaking you go to the best lake and you should reward the state. The state shouldn't have to pay you if they do a good job with their state. Generally speaking, right. it, it 
Because again, I get the whole like they'll never go to California again. But when Clear Lake is in the top five, 10, 15 years in a row and you never go there, well, you should reward the state somehow for doing a damn good job. Right. You know, making the lake. I don't know. No, no, I agree with that. I At the end of the day, it always comes down to money, which yeah. several things do. But I'm with you. I'd like to see him divert, you know, same as MOF with the Northern. I'd like to see him just start going to, you know, lakes that can hold that type of tournament. I mean, they need to be decent sized lakes. But like you said, reward states and areas that that have done a good job at managing their fish. And we brought this up a couple of times on the show, but Smith Mountain Lake right now is taking 27, 28 pounds to win. Yeah. It's it's stupid right now with, with that lake's pulling out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I honestly, and this is the last little thing about that, I wouldn't mind if they adjusted it to make smaller field sizes so you could go more places. I'm not saying 50 boats, but instead yeah. of two to 300 for the Toyotas, because again, I think we're in a constriction market. How receptive people would be to like, we'll raise the entry fees a little bit, but we'll cut down the field size and yeah. we'll go other places. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to see that too. But the same, the same as what you just said. If you start lowering the entry, the field size, and you start lowering the payouts, people. I mean, I know, I remember that year I uh, referenced earlier, the the COVID year where they had that tournament on Norman. I remember Brian New jumped in that Toyota series on Norman because it's his home lake, but he jumped in as a non-boater. And the reason he jumped in a non-boater is because if you won, you won a boat. If you won on the boater side, there were so little boats that you won less. So if you won on the boater side, you won less money than what you won if you won on the co-angler side because the field size was so small. And I think that's why they kind of think for that year. Interesting. Interesting stuff. That's really, really cool, dude. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, one last thing I want to hit you on is like, what is an area of your game that you really want to perfect or a place you want to go and practice to get ready for eventually making a swing at the Toyotas? Yeah, 100% live scope, 100%. You just have to know it if you go up north. Uh, I mean, that's just the nature of the beast. If you're going to St. Lawrence, if you're going to Champlain, there's, you just can't compete without it. There's just no way. There's absolutely no way. So that's something I need to dive full head in on and perfect it because, like I said, there's just those lakes in particular, you just you just have to know it. And it's becoming more and more prevalent, even around the house. We don't have the bass fishing scene that other states do. I mean, we have good anglers and, and several of them, but we're generally a little bit behind the curve, you know what I mean? But even around here, it's starting to the point where live scope's starting to win some tournaments where in the past, you they would never be caught that way. It, it's hard to, talking more about the the practice of it and how you get good at it. I had a two-dayer at Lake Anna, and you know I somehow managed the seventh place, but I lost. The top three caught him on a spinnerbait in two inches of water. Yeah. Go figure. <laughs> and I'm offshore dinking and dunking. And yeah. the hardest thing is when you see so, especially at Lake Ann where there's so much bait and fish offshore. Right. To turn that crap off. Yeah. And then to go beat the bank with everyone else. And I don't know how people that are good at it understand, like, I'm going to stop yeah. and go do this. Yep. I agree, man. It, it, it can be addictive because you see them, you want to catch them, they won't bite, and you just end up. It's almost like sight fishing for a betting fish. Before you know, two hours is gone, and you, you haven't made any progress. Where if you were just fishing for those two hours, you know, maybe you would have caught one, maybe not, but you may have had a better opportunity. But, yeah, it's, man, it's tough. It is. And the whole, there's so much controversy around it, which I'm not a fan of. I mean, I, I like it. I use it. But I don't, I wish there was a way you could figure out how to have some tournaments with it, some tournaments without it, because... I'm not a fan of staring at it all day, but it, it's like crappie. It should be like the crappie league, sort of speak. Um, I think I, I've, I've had the Richmond Crappie Club on the show a couple of times. I didn't know there was two leagues. There's two distinct leagues uh, oh, in crappie yeah. fishing because like the trolling motor on the power poles, that's a crappie yeah. thing. Uh, like yeah. all that crap we're seeing is from the crappie world uh, and, and it works there. And I think yeah. that's what we'll end up having. I'm a huge fan of it in practice. Like it's and this is what I, I keep harping on. It's not that you're going to see every fish take your bait. It's how quickly you can make decisions. And you can scan a cove right. real quick and know if there's bait there or if I should just get the hell out. Like it, it, it cuts yeah. your time down so freaking quick. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I agree. It it shortens the learning curve exponentially just by having it, just being able to see even how the fish react to a certain bait. Mm -hmm. No, a hundred percent. And then you can make your adjustments, but then yeah, the devil in the detail is you got to learn how to turn the damn thing off and fish instinct and balance that out. With that said, are you going to try to go up north a little bit? Uh, Are you going to try to go up north a little bit and practice uh, your smallmouth game or how is your smallmouth game? Uh, so, so it needs work. I mean, admittedly for, to compete with those guys. I mean, I, I mean, I can catch small mouth. It's just, it's a different world up there. Uh, when you need 25 pounds every single day, you know, it's just, if you catch a three or four pounder, it's, uh, well, that's not good enough up here. You know, it's just so different, but yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to hopefully, like I say in the next year or so, I'd like to get a new boat, a little bit bigger boat and start making more regular chips and there in the Potomac as well so that I can feel confident that I can compete when I jump into those. So, yeah, I mean, it's a couple year deal where I'm, it's going to take some, some learning curve, get back into it. So I, I really do want to get a, and if there's a biologist listening, I'd like to get a biologist on about the St. Lawrence. Cause I feel like that, I don't know what you could classify that as. Cause it's, it's not a lake. So it doesn't yeah. do like Lake smallmouth, but it's a hell of a unique river system where yeah. I've been up there one time uh, with my brother. Holy crap. That is not like the Shenandoah river or the upper <laughs> Potomac. <laughs> no, that that's just, it's, and it's a special place, man. It is up there. It's, but it's, it's like being a different, if you've never been up there, it's so hard to tell people what it's like, not only catching those giant small with the numbers of small, but just how much water is moving through that system. Oh my God. They, yeah. Like you just don't use your standard smallmouth techniques up there i mean you catch them on drop shot and all that but it's a whole you know drifting and stuff it's a whole but you need like a one ounce drop shot weight which i didn't bring like you're going to think that a bag of drop shot weights because you're going to go through them like skittles (laughs) nonsense yeah that is facts man it's i don't know i don't know how you like get good with that place unless you practice because it it doesn't simulate anything else like florida lakes get you ready for the potomac river a lot of times i I, there's nothing it's so unique. There's nothing that compares to it. You have to spend time up there to prepare yourself for what's about to go down up there. Cause it, it, like I say, there's just, there's no other body of water that I've ever been to personally that sets up like that. So, but it's, man, it's a phenomenal. I, I love that place up there. I wish it was close. Yeah. Dude, I, I really do. I wish it was closer. And I wish there was like one more lake that we had um, so we could practice on and get good with because our area is kind of it is it is river it is very river centric and i've always thought about that growing up like should i've gotten a jet boat versus a like i I mean i was lucky i got my bass boat you know from a it was repossessed by the bank so i I was really blessed in that situation but i still think like it was hard to go fishing because there's no place to take the damn thing out generally speaking where it's like if i had a jet boat it it opened up so much water because there's not a lot of places for us to go right right yeah Uh, but like I, I wanted to ask this, this would be the last question it was like, are, are there a lot of river smallmouth in West Virginia? Like, I don't know like the river situation in West Virginia. Yeah. So the new is fantastic. And the Shenandoah, Shenandoah is fantastic. Obviously the upper Potomac, um, I believe the state record smallmouth came out of the South branch, but I think it was over seven, seven something. So yeah. it came out of the South branch. Um, yeah. I mean, that's generally it. And trout fishing is what West Virginia is known for, for fishing. The bass fishing kind of takes a backseat to those two just because we have fantastic stream and river fishing. Um, so hopefully we can kind of get the bass fishing up on par with those two because those two are world class. What are the river situation on the western part of the state? Uh, like the Ohio? Yeah, I think. Uh, wait, yeah. The Ohio's in West Virginia, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think so, yeah. 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 Uh, not good Shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> it, it just i don't know that place is a special place in its own in its own right <laughs> uh but no it's i don't know the guys fish it and fish it all the time and guys supposedly love it i've been there really? a handful of times and it just they have bigger that's that's probably the one body of water where they do have bigger tournaments 100 150 boat fields you know fishing for 10 fifteen thousand dollars because the river's so big you know, it's several hundred miles. You can launch up in Wheeling and theoretically go all the way down to uh, Ravenswood or wherever, hundreds of miles away. So wow. spread out, you know, but that said, 
a two day tournament there will take fifteen pounds maybe to win for two days, you know. And that's three, depressing. Three quarters of the field will blank or not catch a limit. It's just man, it's just horrible. It's horrible, horrible fishing. They just fluctuate the water so much with the locks with the bar you know, the barge traffic. So uh, and it floods all it's just not <laughs> I don't even know what they can do to make it better. Honestly, I don't. Dude, that is depressing. Like I don't like you. I've heard the rumors growing up about you know the, the low winds fishing over there and having to deal with that. But oh my yeah. god, yeah, it's tough. It is. Bryson, I I really appreciate you coming on today, getting us a little look to what West Virginia fishing and West Virginia culture does to the bass scene. Because you know, there's not a lot of professional anglers that come out of that area. No, it, it, no there's it's not. hard. <clears throat> They're not. Yeah, and thanks for having me. I appreciate it, man. I really do. I appreciate you reaching out and asking me to be on and uh, look forward to a couple of your next episodes. So, Is there anything that we can promote for you? Any sponsors or anybody you want to give a shout out to? Uh, no, not really. Just all my friends and family that supported me since the college days. You know, the bass fishing, it's not a rock star world. You, say you have your friends, family, wife that are always there for you. Do good, do bad, man. I just I say I appreciate them. So... And I appreciate you having me on. No, absolutely. And love to have you back on again to talk, to talk, talk about this. This is a lot of fun. Again, guys, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about today. If you'd like to, please go check us out on Patreon. If it wasn't for my Patreon supporters, this show would not exist. It's completely run. And basically because of you guys, we are able to do this. Uh, like, subscribe to the channel. And we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.